on just tacos only. So I'm saying maybe roughly like 1,000 to 2,000 tacos a day. Yeah, she does. Too. She has a lot of customers that do that, that, that really appreciate what she does. Oh, yeah, some of them say, Oh, you look like my mom, or you remind uh -huh. me of my mom. <laughs> so, yeah, it's true. It's been a, a great experience for us because we've learned how to work from her, you know? And we, you know, we, um, how do you say it? We owe it all to her, yeah. Do you love working with your kids? ¿Te gusta trabajar con nosotros? Sí, mucho. A lot. So mean. <laughs> we're like, dice mi she said we're her, brazos derechos. her right hands. Cuando ya no estén conmigo es como, me cortan los brazos. She said that the day I leave, or we leave, or we say no more, she won't do it anymore. <laughs> pues yo creo que me, me muero, yo creo. De she said she'll tristeza, die. De tristeza. Oh, of sadness, she says. <laughs> what a surprise. Even on the street, mom's cooking is still the best. So next time, skip the delivery, track down a food truck, and experience flavors from all over the world. For more information, visit the Food Curated homepage on nyc.gov. I'm Liza DeGia. Thanks for watching Food Curated. Be sure to follow us on Twitter and happy eating. I'll see you next week. So I'm like this. How do you like that barbecue? <laughs> That's the display model. This is a sled made by the Flexible Flyer Company that you use on the, on the street. You wouldn't dare do it now because there's too many cars. But years ago, we used to sell ice skates, roller skates, fishing supplies, paint, of course, household goods. We used to sell all that stuff here. If I ever decide to close, I don't know what I'll do. It'll take me a year to clean the place out. Because nobody's going to buy a hardware store, unfortunately. My father bought this store in 1923. The school bus would drop us off here at the store, and then we'd have to go in the back, sit there and do our homework. In 65, I took it over, and I've been here ever since. We're right over here where Highland Boulevard or Southside Boulevard was. Most of the things along the beach here were all bungalows. Everybody had a bungalow. My mother had sisters and brothers, big, big family, and they were not the richest people in the world, you know, and they rented a bungalow down the street. That was their summer vacation, and that's how my father met her. This has been all filled in here with a lot of different material. When they filled in the back of the harbor and more sailboats could pull in, and the yacht clubs flourished, we used to sell stuff from wooden boats, like these bronze through hull fittings. This harbor was a very active place, but then everybody started buying fiberglass boats, and that sort of killed that end of the business. Excuse me for a minute. Yeah, go ahead. Hi, how are you? Sorry, good. Shower head? Sure, right there on the right, right there. Hardware has changed because we don't have any more big, big ticket items. So I have a small one like this. That's all I have right now. Though. Most of the big ticket items go to the box stores. 870. People still come here, and we try to steer them in the right direction, what things to buy and how to fix things. But there's not many of us like that anymore. 
American Hardware Association did a survey and said most people, probably 75%, under the age of 25, have never been in a mom and pop hardware store. This is what real hardware stores sell, right, right here. Nuts and bolts. And we know exactly where everything is. So there's still a need for us. Thanks a lot. Take care. I know everybody that comes in this store. These are my friends. They really are. There was music in the air from saloons, theaters, and families gathered around the piano in homes across the country. And the songs America loved all came from one single block in New York City. It was called Tin Pan Alley. All of these windows that you see right here would have been open, and all of the songs were being demonstrated on these clackety pianos. It sounded like a lot of tin pans uh -huh. being hit and banged together. Sheet music was really the big part of Tin Pan Alley. When they published something that sold two million pieces of sheet music, that's a lot of money at 50 cents a piece. When rock and roll transformed the songs we listened to, Tin Pan Alley didn't disappear. It changed with the times and moved north to 49th and Broadway. The Brill Building could be thought of as a vertical Tin Pan Alley. It was sort of like a little manufacturing plant that brought America's adoring youth all the songs of the day. The Brill Building was a phenomenon. I sold 25 million records between 1958 and 1963 to the shock of my parents. American pop songs have gone digital, but not musical theater. That still made the old-fashioned way. Musical theater is still an art form that you have to get out there. You have to perform a composer and a lyricist doing their own songs at the piano. That tradition is very much like Ten Pan Alley. If you want to walk to places where songs came alive and shows made magic, follow me as we listen for the musical secrets of New York. The music business started out small in New York City mostly pieces for church services or popular songs like Camp Town Races by Stephen Foster in the 1850s. Music was something you heard when you went to the theater, so there was no reason to go out and buy it. Before the 19th century, there was no real sheet music industry. There was no recording industry, certainly. There was no radio. And the big change was mass production. The same way American factories were turning out plows and sewing machines, by 1890, cheap, upright pianos were in millions of homes, saloons, and even ice cream parlors. People needed something to play. And with it came this idea that you could mass produce sheet music like newspapers and like magazines, like other things that were printed. Music really could be something like a business rather than something that just a few people knew about. A new industry was born on the streets of Manhattan. Merchants who'd sold women's clothing the year before realized there was a lot more money in the music trade. If I can sell a corset, said one of them, I can sell a song. They became music publishers, and by 1900, dozens of them were side by side on West 28th Street between 6th Avenue and Broadway. The phrase Tim Pan Alley is often used to describe popular songwriting and popular music. A lot of people don't realize that it actually was a real place, this very block of 28th Street. We're assaulted right now by <laughs> the traffic, but right. I guess at that time it was a different sound. Right. You would have heard a lot of new songs um, being, being tested. Every music publisher on the block had what was known as a song demonstrator. He would have been pounding out new songs on these cheap pianos. To one observer, it sounded like a lot of tin pans. That 
was how Tin Pan Alley got its name. So would I have seen performers or reps for them walking down the street listening to potential hits? Yes. As a matter of fact, this was the theatrical district at the time, and many vaudevillians congregated here. Vaudeville was a many different acts on a bill. You had singers, dancers, eccentric people. Uh, it, it was a whole show. So to have a new song introduced by one of these great stars like Al Jolson or Eddie Canner, the public just went wild for this. Now he's getting out, I know. Vince Giordano leads the Nighthawks, a band that specializes in the music of the 1920s and 30s. By the time Prohibition hit, Tin Pan Alley had published tens of thousands of songs. Since the key was getting a song heard by the public, music publishers would hire people known as song pluggers. A song plugger would go to the theaters and he would wait for whatever singers were on the show at the vaudeville house. And as they would come out, they would pester them and say, hey, you got to hear this. Hey, I got a song for you, Joe. They would grab a hold of them and just pester them and bug them to do this, this, this song because this is the greatest song ever written. This one's perfect for you. They had a whole bunch of baloney <laughs> that they would keep using over and over again. See, how are you going to miss with a tune like that? Dave, from the heart. Terrible. Song plugging was a way to break into the music business, and a couple of talented teenagers named George Gershwin and Irving Berlin started that way. Irving Berlin is an interesting case. He went to theaters pretending to be a member of the audience, and he would demand a song, or he would ask a song to be repeated. Nobody really realized he was being paid by the publishers. But that's how they all learned what they were doing. Recordings and player piano rolls were helping to push the music business to new heights. Now you could buy a piano that played the latest hits all by itself. Music poured out of Tin Pan Alley into the Tenderloin, a red light district that surrounded it. Here on West 28th Street is a ghost of that time, a former gambling house run by a gangster named Shang Draper. Shang Draper had been one of the most successful bank robbers in the 1870s and made a huge amount of money. And then he took this house over and it really prospered. So who would have come and gone through this building? Many different types of people. You would have had performers who congregated at the Tin Pan Alley publishing offices. Uh -huh. Tin Pan Alley and this type of gambling house were part of the same large tenderloin world. Walking up the back stairs of Shang Draper's elegant club, the latest songs would have drifted up through the walls, from the music publishers outside and from inside the building as well. Most saloons and gambling houses hired a piano player to keep the customers happy. The whole purpose for the songwriter was to get the song heard by as many people as possible. So the gamblers who came here as part of the tenderloin industry could be counted on to hear a song and then take it with them back to wherever it was they came from. As the theater district and their stars moved towards Times Square, the music publishers followed, leaving 28th Street for offices further north. But the name Tin Pan Alley stuck to the business of writing pop music for a mass market. The Brill Building was completed in 1931, and by 1940, it was full of musicians and publishers. Its Art Deco mirrors have reflected the likes of Duke Ellington and Paul Simon, but its peak began in the late 1950s. I think the Brill Building could be thought of as a vertical Tin Pan Alley. The people who were banging on the piano in that new space were the songwriters rather than the publishers. They may not have been as accomplished as somebody like Neil Sedaka, as an example, but they knew the chords, the four or five or six chords that they needed to, to play. Breaking up is hard to do. Don't take your love. Neil Sedaka was still a teenager in 1958 and on his way to becoming a classical pianist when he and his friend Howie Greenfield 
showed up to audition for one of the big time publishers at the Brill Building. We walked in and we played some songs. We were turned down. And walking out, I saw Mort Schumann and Doc Palmas, who were quite famous. They started to write for Elvis Presley and the Drifters. Mort Schumann knew Sadaka from high school and told them to try a new publisher run by Al Nevins and Don Kirshner. Don answered the door with a broom in his hand. He said, I'm sorry, we're in conference. The fact was they were sweeping up and wondering how they were going to pay the rent for this little office. They said, come back after lunch. And Howie and I came back. We played our four or five songs. And they said, where did you steal these songs? I said, no, we wrote these songs. Don Kirshner knew Bobby Darren, who was dating Connie Francis at the time. And Francis was the top female vocalist in the country with a number one hit, Who's Sorry Now? Who's sorry now? Kirshner arranged a meeting. Going to Connie Francis' house was, oh, I was scared to death. And of course, when I played, I started with my best ballads, and she was bored to tears. She was on the phone, she was writing in her diary, she was answering mail, and I was beginning to lose her. When I finally whispered in Howie's ear, I'm going to play Stupid Cupid, he said, that's not her style. That's a eight-bar blues. You know, it's a funky song. I said, well, I'm going to do it anyway. So I played eight bars of it, and she said, that's my next record. Stupid Cupid, you're a real mean guy. Stupid Cupid went to number 14 on the pop charts. Nevins and Kirshner signed up Howie Greenfield and Neil Sedaka for $50 a week. Sadaka was so young, his mother had to sign for him. I was writing with a group of songwriters at the time. One was Carol Klein, who soon changed her name later to Carol King. And then uh, Kirshner Nevins signed Barry Mann and Cynthia Weil, Ellie Greenwich and Jeff Barry. And it was little cubicles with a piano and a desk. And we went in five days a week. I do remember hearing the pianos. It was almost like the cacophony that you might have heard in the old Tin Pan Alley days. But you actually heard people plunking pianos in different rooms on the same floor. Working in the Brill Building was good competition. It made you work harder because at the end of the day, Al Nevins had a red piano in his office and all of us played what we had written that day. The best song went to the Righteous Brothers, the Chiffons, whoever was the big, big singers of the day. The only pitfall was the walls were very thin. So after a while, the songs sounded alike. Breaking Up Is Hard To Do hit number one in August of 1962. In fact, Nevins and Kirshner's writers created top 10 hits for years. Just like Tin Pan Alley, the song was more important than the person who sang it. The important thing to remember is that this sort of transition from the earlier kind of pop music, the one that's sort of based on Broadway, the pop music of Irving Berlin and Cole Porter, uh, going forward up into rock and roll, it was not that radical a difference because you still have songs that were written by professional composers and sung by professional singers. And people say, well, wasn't that like a, uh, a factory? Well, I say no, it was more like a workshop where everybody did what they did best. You go in, get a song played, out of it came a contract, out of it came a demo record, out of it came a trip to the producer, and then the release of the recording. It all happened in one place. The Brill Building had some of the top sound recording studios in the city. And on the second floor is a secret of the music business from the days before audio went digital. This is the Foley Room inside the Brill Building. It's where sound effects were added to hundreds of movies and TV shows, like breaking glass or walking in all these different types of shoes. It's a part of a world of music all in one place. 
But the Foley room is slated for demolition and the sound studios are empty. Most of the offices where songwriters knocked out top 10 hits are deserted. The big change for rock and roll came in 1964 when the Beatles and Bob Dylan moved away from songs by professional songwriters to music they'd written themselves. In 1963, it was still perfectly acceptable to sing songs that were written by the great composers at the Brill Building, but by 1967, 68, if you didn't write your own songs and you were a phony. Rock legends like Fats Domino and Elvis Presley were derailed by the new sound of the British invasion. Neil Sedaka, who had been singing his own songs, found his recipe for success wasn't working anymore. And I called it the sandwich song. Why? Because at the beginning was a piece of bread. Tra la 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 happy birthday, sweet 16. Then the meat of the song. Tonight's the night I've waited for because you're not a baby anymore. Happy birthday, sweet 16. And at the end of the record, another piece of bread. Tra la 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 la. So I called it the sandwich song. It was a downfall because I felt I had a winning formula and I repeated it too many times. Tonight, tonight, I've waited for. Some Brill Building stars like Sadaka and Carol King made successful comebacks in the 1970s. Others, like Connie Francis, never had a hit song again. But the history of the Brill isn't over. Creating a workplace for new pop culture with the museum to the Songwriters Hall of Fame in the Art Deco lobby is what the building's new owner, Eric Hader, hopes to do. So many of the people that were and are involved in the Songwriters Hall of Fame had their past some way connected to the Brill. Mm -hmm. So the kind of person that we think will be attracted to that history is a creative person in many fields. Does it help, Eric, to have like-minded people all in the same building? It makes a huge difference. Creative people like to feel that they're in a building with other creative people, regardless of whether it's their specific field or not. That's always been the vibe of the Brill, and that's something that's very important for us to maintain. With the writers of Tin Pan Alley gone, does that mean that nobody's sitting down at a piano and selling songs anymore? Well, try going to the theater. Say what now? Say so what? If I knew him quite, quite well. Much better. I should say she's talking about the dead guy. That's important yeah. to set up. Joe Canosian and Kellen Blair created a musical called Murder for Two that opened off Broadway. Joe writes the music, Kellen writes the lyrics. I'll send Kellen a track that goes, protocol says, ba 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 ba. And we'll go from there. from there. And there's a little bit of back and forth. Every now and then I, I'll say, you know, I added two syllables here. I hope that's okay. Yeah, or, yeah. or he'll and say. That's this gray hair on the exactly. <laughs> exactly. Protocol says be strict. Keep your cool or you'll be licked. Murder for Two makes one of a bunch of different types of songs, doesn't it? <laughs> Murder for Two, uh, I think, pays homage to uh, an earlier style of songwriting, mostly from the 30s. Would you say that it smacks of Tin Pan Alley and the songwriters at the time? I think the parallel is that music in theater is still, for the most part, can be reduced to a piano and a voice. Mm -hmm. And a lot of producers have actually told us they do prefer for us to come in and play something live. Actually, a parallel to Tin Pan Alley is the fact that we saw people writing really, really good shows, but we didn't always see people able to show those shows to people in a way that made it clear what the potential of that show was. Mm -hmm. And we thought, how cool would it be if... If that was the show. If, if this is the show. Right. Uh -huh. we're just gonna, we wrote it and we're just going to do it for you. Their sales pitch worked, partly because Murder for Two is a musical played by just two actors. Brett Ryback plays a young police officer investigating a murder at a country house full of suspects. Jeff Blumenkrantz plays all 12 suspects. I'd never been asked to play 12 people, have conversations with myself, you know, turn on a dime. This show has its own rules, but I think what's on the page is two writers having a lot of fun breaking the rules and doing it with a lot of wit. 
So at this point of the show, uh, Officer Marcus has met all of the suspects and then is surprised to find a 12-member boys' choir hiding in the corner. So he immediately runs up to them and says, you gotta get out of here. This must be pretty difficult for you youngsters. Difficult? Because of one lousy dead body? You got a lot to learn about kids, chief. We been around the block a time or two and seen a lot more, right? Don't imagine that we're not all right. Because we seen a lot worse. To tell the truth, if we was younger, we'd be getting sicker now. But our skin's a little thicker now, cause we seen a lot worse. We seen a fella torn in two one day by a gorilla at the zoo one day. We hardly ever make it through one day without a glimpse of horror. No need to intervene, we seen a lot worse. It has that old timey feel, even though it's a twisted lyric. Musically, the song, you know, it makes people comfortable and happy. And I'm on my knees. I do a dance break on my knees. And if we reach 13, we'll see you on voice. Creating a musical is one of the hardest challenges in theater. Even more than a star performer, success depends on a good book, clever lyrics, and music you remember. Not unlike a hit song. You can't depend on any one big star actor to stay there doing eight performances a week for 10 years. It's just not going to happen. In a certain sense, it is like the Ten Pen Alley model all over again in that the show and the songs have become the, the end product yet again. OK, welcome, everyone. A new season, very exciting. I hope you were all writing furiously. Before we start, I want to talk about a Cole Porter song today. We don't tell people what to write or how to write or what style to write in, but we do talk about the craft of musical theater. You're a sublime, you're a turkey dinner. Patrick Cook and Rick Frere run the famous BMI Musical Theater Workshop in Manhattan. It's where Joe and Kellen first met, and it's where a lot of award-winning musicals, like A Chorus Line and Avenue Q, have gotten their start over the past 50 years. Pat and I, although we're teaching the class and attempting to guide people, we can't teach as much as the audience can teach. We get about 40 people sitting there. They become a much wiser being than any individual, that collective of the audience listening to a song. Teams of writers audition their work in front of other members for feedback and the workshop is completely subsidized by Broadcast Music Incorporated, so there's no tuition. But you have to have talent to get in. I feel like lyrically, I really want to know what he's up against. I thought you had such a gorgeous polyphonic thing happening there that I wanted more of it. Every year has its own stars, you know, and uh, Joe and Kellen were definitely stars right away. And I'll just say one thing about Joe's music. He understands what's been written before, and yet, what he writes sounds fresh. So he's taking what's been done before and building upon it and doing something new with it. Murder for Two ends with a four-handed piece where the show's over and the two guys just sit down and just play and do this sort of razzle-dazzle piano number that's very much based on Harpo and Chico Marx. will start with their eyes closed, playing it from far away with their eyes closed, and then it develops into running around and switching places and all of that stuff. Mm -hmm. We reach over each other, we reach around back behind each other, a lot of glisses that end with a, a gunshot note. And to really do it in true Marx Brothers fashion, it's hard to be accurate. And we're often not accurate. <laughs> that the experience that someone may have had arriving in New York City wanting to be a songwriter, walking down 28th Street with all those big windows open to the street and the, the cacophony of pianos and singing and people hawking songs. We may not have that exactly in this room, but I think we have a modern day parallel, which is the intermixing and fusion of people's creativity and ideas bouncing off of each other. Wherever you have that, whether it's Tin Pan Alley, the Brill Building, uh, Liverpool in the 1950s, new things take root. There is still a romance about 
a composer and a lyricist doing their own songs at the piano. And sometimes your best shot of getting a show produced is to get into a producer's office and, and say, listen to this. You know, Kelly, this has been a lot of fun. Um, we have a little something we'd like to share with you for your uh, consideration oh, yeah? for your, you know, well, your yeah. needs. And we actually think this would make celebrity. a really great theme song for Secrets of New York. Oh, so we're kind of thinking, me now. it's kind of actually brilliant, it's kind of brilliant. So Yeah, it's going to change your life. The next 40 seconds, yeah, just kind of be show. surprised. Yeah. So we'll give you a good deal. Ready? All ready. <gasps> Come with us, there's much to learn. Tales we'll all enjoy. Fun awaits round every turn. Just ask Kelly Joy. <laughs> if you get excited by old things and people who died long ago, it's time to know the secrets of New York. That song is really sweet, but could it really fit this show? Like they say on Tin Pan Alley, this could be the next big hit, but that song could never be big. Or could it? Come with us, there's much to learn. Tales we'll all enjoy, oh baby. Fun awaits round every turn. Ask the one and only Kelly Joy. This city is filled with secrets and hit songs. All you have to do is listen for them. Thus, there's much to learn. Tales we'll all enjoy, oh baby. Fun awaits round every turn. Ask the one and only Kelly Joy. If you get excited by old things and people who died long ago, it's time to learn the secrets of. Go out and find those secrets of. It's time to learn the secrets of. definition cameras, two stereo microphones, one digital audio recorder, all on one bike. Role play, boldly going where no quiz show has gone before. The country's first credit card was issued in 1951 to 200 people who could only use them in 27 New York City restaurants. What was the name of that first credit card? American Express. American Express. It could be American Express. American Express. No. Oh, wow. It's not Visa. MasterCard. It's not MasterCard. Chase. And Diners Club. Diners Club. Diners Club. I think it's a diner. Discover. I'm thinking it's Diners Club. <laughs> I lost. I'm sorry. <laughs> In the classic 1968 Japanese science fiction film, Destroy All Monsters, what monster attacks New York City? Tarantula. A giant tarantula? Yeah. Godzilla would be the obvious answer. Mothra. Ronan? Probably Godzilla. 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 The gorilla? Godzilla? Godzilla the gorilla? <laughs> Isn't he a gorilla? I don't know. <laughs> Big lizard. I know just what he looked like. Godzilla. Yeah, I got it. <laughs> Godzilla. I don't exactly. Oh yeah. Nice. Are you his father? No. Yeah. You know you're in the show now. No, I you see, you're right there. You Take me. <laughs> <laughs> What popular kids' attraction sits on 14 acres of seaside property in Coney Island? Amusement park. Amusement park. The roller coaster. Baseball field. The big wheel. Nathan's hot dogs. The old world's fair. Think water. 
It has something to do with the ocean. Something to do with water. Surf gardens. Surf gardens, you made that up. Yeah, I made it up. If you love the ocean, you should go there. Fish market? It's the aquarium. Oh. The aquarium. It's the New York aquarium. Oh, aquarium! I love that place. You're on camera, right? Oh, see, I right see, there. I see. Yeah. All right. You want to say, <laughs> role play? Hello. <laughs> Kids will spend eight minutes decorating their little brother. Brushing for two minutes now can save your child from severe tooth pain later. Two minutes, twice a day. They have the time. This program is brought to you in part by City Winery. Welcome back to Books du Jour, where we have a new panel of a very interesting guests, a very engaged guests, I should say. They're going to talk about uh, probably the life journey. So my first guest is uh, Kelly Cogswell, uh, Heating Fire. You know, my life as a lesbian adventure. She's going to explain to us what is, uh, Heating Fire is and uh, what an adventure is. Sorry. My second guest is uh, Gwen Elderman. It's a tr book about uh, a trip to Warsaw, the train to Warsaw happens during uh, back and forth between World War II and the present. And finally, uh, How to Survive a Bullet to the Heart. Uh, it's not a book about vampires, is it? But John Wareham. It is a book about what? Vampires. No, it isn't okay. a book about vampires. Well, you could make you could an make argument case. that you could, yeah. Well, I wouldn't we'll, say we'll, that. We'll but. come back to that. But let's talk about eating fire. Who are the, the Avengers, the lesbian Avengers? The Lesbian Avengers were a direct action group that started in 1992 in New York City. Um, calling attention to lesbian issues and making lesbians more visible. And then gradually they spread and became a worldwide phenomenon with chapters, 60 chapters all over the world and Canada and Australia and all over the US. It was started by um, six longtime activists in New York, um, specifically to deal with lesbian issues. It was a moment when you know there was ACT UP, there were lots of women's organizations, and then this group of people thought, well, it's ti finally time for us to do something for ourselves. So why writing a book about that experience? What was that important to you? The f impulse was just to chronicle yeah. this group that had been forgotten, because it involved so many people, but it was kind of erased from history. But then gradually, as I started writing about it, um, because the group started in 1992, the year, the same year that um, Pat Buchanan went to the Republican National Convention, mm -hmm. and essentially declared a war, a culture war, for the soul of America, and the enemies of that soul of America were environmentalists and feminists and gay people. It also gradually became kind of a dialogue with that. Um, every time the Avengers stepped out onto the street, they were having a dialogue with this bigger thing called America. So after the, you know, two thirds of the book is about the Avengers, and then the last part is um, still kind of continues thinking about what does it mean to be an American, what does it mean to be a lesbian. So when did you get involved with the group? When did you get started? Immediately, I was at the first meeting. Following the speech of Pat Buchanan, there were lots and lots of anti-gay campaigns across the country. And even now, every time there's an anti-gay campaign, like in Arizona or Texas, um, violence follows. People get hurt, people get beat up, people die. And in Oregon, two lesbian, a lesbian and a gay man were burned to death. So the Avenger response was, how do we transform this image of getting burned to death into something powerful? So the Lesbian Avengers learned how to eat fire to transform that image of violence against us. Yeah. I, I was 
struck by reading your book. It's uh, you read like an old-fashioned political book, like you read from the sixties or from like you know the the, the anarchist in the, in Russia in eighteen twenty. Because it's you are in the, you are doing it. It's not like a an academic book or a study of sociology and what it means to be a gender bias and what it means to be a dyke in the modern world. But actually, you are in the streets and you get beaten down and uh, and you get locked up. And I mean, yeah. how do you handle all that after so many years? The Avengers ended badly, so I kind of put out the lesbian Avengers out of my mind for a while. So I had to kind of go back and think, well, what was it like to be on the streets in 1992? And what was it like to just come to New York? Because I'm from Kentucky, so it was kind of a big shock to turn up in New York. And I thought it was important to just kind of give the flavor of all of this stuff as it happens, because I think this is finally the way history is made by individuals and then, you know, 20 years later, you find out your life is part of history, and it's... You were dying bread. I think everyone was behind a computer and doing other things, but, uh, I mean, there was Occupy Wall Street. And I often ask a question to the writer, do you think there was an opportunity lost there? Or some um, kind of opportunity? I think, actually, there was a gap in direct action um, in this country, and specifically in New York. Like, yeah. when I was a part of the Lesbian Avengers, there had been activists on the street pretty much since labor movements um, and feminist movements and um, civil rights movement and anti-war movements. And then there was this big gap. So I think when Occupy Wall Street came along, they're kind of like, well, we saw it happening in Egypt, but we don't quite know how to do it. As long as there are cities, there are going to be people using that way to protest. There are people doing that now in France and people in the Ukraine. I mean, it's. You're going. You lived in France many years, I believe, yes. right? In Paris. Yes. So you know, I think of the French strike, the grève. Yeah? Yes, all the time. All the time. All the time. Constant. I mean, we're talking about the failure of Wall Street, of the Occupy Wall Street. What do you think? Yeah. I think it did not really concretize. They are more like an, a, an activism, if it were supposed yeah. to happen, and it does happen in Europe. Well, I think it's a completely different culture. People like to think. I mean, Americans love. French culture, and they like to think that it's very close to their own, but I think actually it's very, very different. I think French culture is far more traditional uh, than, than American culture. And they're very much, here it's constant change. Things are changing all the time, and there, very little changes. Uh, so it's a completely different mindset. The, the character of your novel. Yes. Uh, it goes back and forth between the present and the, and the past, and uh, there's a rigidity about them. The, the memories, yes. the pain is still there. Yes. And it's the forgiveness or self-acceptance. Self -acceptance. Well, there, in the beginning, there's great resistance on his part right, yeah. to going back. He doesn't want to go back. He wants to forget the past. She is feeling nostalgic for her youth, and she wants to go back. She remembers what it was like before the war. So she talks him into going back. Mm -hmm. They go back, and the whole thing is, I mean, these are people who are in exile, which was, in fact, true of everybody um, who was Jewish during the war. Whatever your fate was, your fate was to be in exile. And in the case of my characters, they had really lost almost everything. They had lost uh, their country, their language, their culture, their families, everything. But there's a difference between being forced into exile and do a sort of voluntary exile. Absolutely. But when you went to Paris, it was... You wanted to do no. that. <laughs> that was right. very, very well, it's a kind different. of a linguistic exile, isn't it? It was very, very different. You learn certain things about what it is to, to, to live and operate in a country that's not your own. I speak fluent French, but even so, you know, there were things, for example, when, when I would get together with people, you know, dinner parties, parties, something like that, and they would begin to talk about their childhoods, and they would use certain, you know, they would talk about, use certain words, or they would talk about certain institutions or whatever. Then I sort of lost the, the thread of things, even though I spoke, I, I speak very good French. But that's when you realize, you know, things, things are different. And of course, you're never in another place, you're never in the same situation as in your own yeah. country. There's so much you don't understand, there's so much that you, you know, you just, you have less power, I think, in, in, in many ways. Mm -hmm. So the, the, the idea for the book came from where? I was always fascinated by the fate of the Jews during the war and studied it for years and years and yeah. years. And I wanted to write a book about exile. Uh, and I thought for a while about where I would set it. And I finally decided on the Warsaw Ghetto, which I had read about. 
But I read a book called Caput, which is an absolutely incredible book. I don't know if you've read it, by someone named Curzio Malaparte. Oh, yes. Um, very brutal and difficult, but extremely good. Curzio Malaparte was actually in Warsaw during that time. He was a diplomat. Hans Frank, who was the governor general of Poland, um, has a dinner party in which he invites Nazis. Uh, and they decide after dinner to take uh, a tour of the ghetto, because this was actually a tourist attraction. The ghetto was a tourist attraction. Yeah. And uh, when Nazis came to Warsaw, um, they were often asked whether they would like to go to the ghetto. And it was like going to a kind of a fun fair. That was the idea. Uh, and they would be taken to the ghetto. And they were then allowed to do whatever they liked. They were given guns, they were given whips, and they could have a good time. And I thought, th this is absolutely incredible. I have to, I have to write about the Warsaw Ghetto. Mm. So, right writing another Jewish story, when there's so many about World War II, yes. what, what are you adding to the dialogue? So I wanted mm. to explore something of what uh, people experience uh, to be in exile. Yeah. In the case of my two characters, the only home they really have is each other. Mm. 